Hi, thanks for checking out today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today's message is about the redemption story of Joseph's journey. We will be studying in the book of Genesis, chapters 41 through 50. As always, you can download the Life Notes and follow along by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Robert Smith. You can go ahead and have a seat. It is good to be with you today. And uh, if you've got a Bible or Bible app on your device, I encourage you to open to the book of Genesis, chapter 50. Genesis 50 is where we're going to be at. Uh, I did not get a page number beforehand, so uh, you're going to have to start that first book, find your way all the way to the back of the first book, Genesis, there, and you'll find your spot there. Uh, And, you know, as we go through the book of Genesis, much of what is there is the story of family and how families progress and the family lineage that that continues, and then the last big section of Genesis is the story of Joseph and his family. And family resonates with us. We're always at Calvary talking about families and how to have healthier families no matter what stage of family you are at. And uh, it's because we know that, that the quality of a family determines the future, the future of generations, the future of people, the future of a nation. And, uh, and maybe you can resonate with that. You can look at your family of origin and see the ways that they blessed you and the things that they sowed into your life that today you can be thankful for. Or maybe conversely, you can look at your family of origin and see the ways they didn't bless you and the struggles, the hangups, the hurts that you carry to this day because of your family of origin. And as we look at Genesis, we see that lived out. We see the, the long-standing effect that, that family has on a person, but also on generations. Because we've been following the story of Joseph and his dysfunctional family tree, and we see that, that his life has been completely upended and altered because of the decisions of his family. He is now in another nation without freedom, without autonomy, living a completely different life than what he imagined because his brothers decided to sell him as a slave to get him out of their life. And so when you look at this story, you can see just the incredible lasting impact that that family's decisions had on him. And it also makes what we see in chapter 50 that much more surprising to us. Because in Genesis 50, starting in verse 18, it says this. It says, his, it is Joseph's brothers, came and fell before him and said, behold, we are your servants. Well, there's a plot twist. Verse 19, but Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. How on earth did we get there? I don't know if you like spoilers, but that was just like the, ma- the, the massive spoiler right there to the entire Joseph story. Because we see the, the progression of his life and how he goes from being in that place of brother to being a, sold into slavery to then being put in prison and forgotten about. And then we're here. And so what I want to do in our time together today as we wrap up the story of Joseph is is think about how did he get there? How did this redemption of a family take place and what can we learn from it? Because this is, after all, a true story. As God brought it into scripture, he found it important enough that we today, some 3,600 years later, should be looking at it and reflecting on it and learning from it. I think as we look at this final kind of chapter in the the story of Joseph and his family, we see that when we trust God and live out the grace that he's given to us, we see his transforming work around us. So what's this look like? What I want to do is kind of walk us through uh, just nine short chapters of Genesis uh, today. So I hope you don't have dinner plans. I'm kidding. But uh, we're we're going to start in in chapter 41. If you want to kind of follow along, we'll be skipping around, but... But we see the, the, the progression here includes God working in kind of three distinct phases to bring things about. And the first phase is that God worked to redeem Joseph's story. So if you've not been with us for all uh, of the three weeks thus far, there's been this decreasing kind of progression in his life. It's not that Joseph has had ups and downs, it's just a lot of downs and some of them worse than others. 
but there's been this decreasing kind of level of freedom and autonomy and significance that he's experienced. He goes from being this brother with freedom, with a hope for the future and a, a dream that God has given him to being sold as a slave. And he's doing well, he's working for this guy named Potiphar, but he, he still doesn't have freedom, but he's got some significance, only to be falsely accused of something he didn't do and be sent to prison. In prison, he again has experienced a step down and he's doing his best and he sees an opportunity to serve one of the king's servants, the cupbearer of the king, and he, he helps this person and maybe that's this glimmer of hope that he can get out of this situation. His only request to this cupbearer is just remember me. And he didn't for two years. So Joseph has experienced this progression downward and then all of a sudden, after two years, God begins to work to redeem his story. Because after those two years, the, the Pharaoh the, uh, of Egypt, he experiences these dreams that just shake him to the core and he can't figure out what they mean. He calls all of his advisors, all the important people, and no one can help him. And the cupbearer goes, oh yeah, I was supposed to remember something. And if you have that moment, you're like, oh, I was supposed to remember that. That was the cupbearer. And he goes, hey, there's this guy when I was in prison, he like interpreted a dream, maybe he can help you. And so in Genesis 41 and verse 14, it says, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they quickly brought him out of the pit. They, the Bible says it is a pit. And then he had shaved himself and changed his clothes. He came in before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there's no one who can interpret it. I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Verse 16, and Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. I find that so surprising because this is like Joseph in at least two years, his first glimmer of hope that he can get out of prison and he's brought before Pharaoh, he's brought out of the literal pit and brought here and he says, hey, can you interpret a dream? And Joseph doesn't go, yeah, I can interpret for you, just promise that I'm gonna have freedom and you're gonna let me out. He just goes, no, nah, I can't do it but God can. I think there's power in the faith that he demonstrates there. He, he goes, hey, I can't do this, but the God that I worship and follow and serve can. And there's confidence there that God will do this. And so the story continues that, that Joseph, through God's wisdom and direction, interprets that there's gonna be seven years of plentiful harvest and, and food bearing, followed by seven years of incredible famine and hardship in the land. And Joseph presents this and lays out and says, hey, we have to prepare. People will die if we don't plan for those seven years of famine. And so we need to spend the next seven years collecting food and getting ready to prepare for that moment that we're suffering. And Pharaoh is so moved by his faith in God and so moved by the clarity of his message and his plan that he goes, yes, I'm gonna listen to this. And not only that, he says, congratulations, you're in charge of that plan. Any of you have one of those jobs that when you come up with a good idea, you get the good idea to be in charge of that too? You get that nice little gift? That was Joseph. He's like, hey, I got this great idea. And they're like, cool, you're in charge of it. But what's so amazing is that Pharaoh knew in order for that to succeed, Joseph would have to have authority and power and significance. And so he is promoted to second in command in all of Egypt. And just... One fell swoop, he goes from pit to palace, this place of his life completely changed and transformed. And when we look at this, we can't help but see the power and hand of God here because Joseph did literally nothing to change this. In fact, the one thing he did try to kind of put in a good word with the cupbearer for two years basically did nothing until God delivered a dream to Pharaoh. So we look at this, we see how God works to redeem people's stories. We see as well an illustration of, of Romans 8, 28. Romans 8 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now we can erroneously read that, that verse and go, oh, that means if I just love God and follow him and I'm called to his purpose and nothing bad will happen in my life. That's not what we actually see in scripture. It doesn't resonate in Joseph's story. But what we do see is that even though bad things happen, even though these terrible circumstances took place, God still worked to redeem his story and bring about good in the life of Joseph. And that had a, a ripple effect to the nations. See, God worked to bless and redeem Joseph's life even though he was in prison. 
Joseph was a blessing to the nations even though he was sold as a slave because God worked and redeemed. So we get this, this picture of what God can do if we're willing to trust and follow him. Because God worked to redeem Joseph's story, but we also see that this next movement is that God worked to redeem Joseph's family. Because this is great, Joseph experienced this, this restoration and redemption in one part of his life. He's like, man, I'm finally living in this hope that I had for my future, but there had to be this thing in the back of his head that he wished he was back home. As we continue in verse 42, the, the seven years of plenty are over. They're now in a couple years into the, the famine. And the famine has struck Joseph's family back home. And in chapter 42, we see that the, the father, Jacob, he goes, hey, we gotta do something about this. We're gonna die. And they had heard that, that Egypt had food. And so he sent most of the sons down there to go collect food. And they arrive and they begin to ask for grain to, to survive and when they come in, Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize Joseph. And I wish that scripture told us why that was, was that he had this like crazy, like Egyptian garb and headdress and like, it was like the Halloween costume of all Halloween costumes. Like, was it that? Was it that they were expecting him to be dead at this point, some 20 years later? Was it that a decade plus of Joseph living a horrific and difficult life had physically taken its toll on him to where he didn't look the same. Either way, Joseph uses his anonymity to his brothers to try and figure out, are they the same terrible people or has something changed? And so for three or four chapters, we see this, this passage back and forth. They get grain, they go back home, and they're back and forth and Joseph is trying to learn about his brothers without revealing who he is. He finds out that there's a new favorite son. It's not him, but it's his younger brother named Benjamin. He gets the brothers to bring him down, and then he falsely accuses Benjamin of theft and throws him in jail. And this is the, the, the culminating point in this, this reunion of the brothers because he's wanting to see if what they're going to do. Are they going to abandon yet another brother and move on with their life? But instead, we see that Judah, the very one whose idea it was to sell Joseph as his slave in the first place, Judah, speaks up. He is so concerned about what losing another son would do to his father that he speaks up and says, hey, if you'll let Benjamin go free, I'll take his place. And at that, Joseph breaks his anonymity. We see this in, in chapter 45, verse 13, or verse three, rather, and Joseph said to his brothers, it is I, Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at their presence. There had to be just like jaw drop across all of them, just, what? So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they drew near and he said, I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me to you to preserve life for the famine has been in the land these two years and yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and keep alive for you many survivors. So it's not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and a Lord to all in his house and ruler over the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. Man, what a, a powerful story we can see here. What a powerful moment of, of redemption and reconciliation that took place here, the forgiveness that, that Joseph offered. You see just the, the, the change that was brought about and how through those 20 some odd years that Joseph had finally worked through what had happened to him and was able to see God's hand at work, how he's able to choose joy and see God's purpose and work even though his circumstances were awful. We see how the brothers at some level had experienced life change and had learned to love each other, even sacrificially enough to, to take each other's place in jail. And because of that, they drew near to each other and, and were reconciled. And I think this shows how that when we fix our eyes on God, when we go, hey, I'm going to follow God and pursue after him, redemption and transformation can happen even in the unlikeliest of places. Because when you look at the first three quarters of this man's story, you don't expect this family to reconcile. 
And yet God in his power brought that to be. And this also shows us that God worked to allow for forgiveness. Joseph offers it there as, as an initial response to their reunion and meeting each other and, and bringing it together. And he continues and he works with Pharaoh to get his brothers and his whole family a place that they can live nearby so that they can be united so he can take care of them and continue to provide for them. And so they all relocate down. And they've got several years of working together and, and building and healing their family. And then in chapter 50, Jacob dies. And the brothers freak out because they think, oh, our brother's just been doing the long con here. This is where it goes bad for us. Dad's not here to play referee, and so this is going to go bad for all of us. Verse 15 of chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their family, was, their father rather, was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us. Maybe. They said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Verse 18, where we opened this, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be cleft alive as they are today. So you do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. See, it was one thing for, for Joseph to express some kindness and some mercy in that first reunion, but here we are many years later, and the opportunity to take vengeance was there before him the opportunity to wipe out his family, the opportunity to take punishment on them was right in front of him and he chose instead to live in forgiveness. And, and apart from the work of God to soften hearts and to, to help understand the, the grace and kindness of our heavenly father, I don't know how this is possible. And yet Joseph demonstrated that trust, that trust in God to that led him to forgive, to offer mercy and grace to his family because he trusted in God through all the seasons of his life. He trusted God when he was a slave. He trusted God when he was in a foreign land. He trusted God when he was forgotten. He trusted God when he was given a mission that was probably enormous and overwhelming. He trusted God when he had the opportunity to take revenge and instead trusted God's plan for mercy and forgiveness. And because Joseph trusted God, his life was changed and transformed. But what about us? What about you? Will you trust God? Will you walk in that trust? Will you choose to trust and obey God when you don't understand what that next step looks like and, and fully understand it? Will you trust God and, and be faithful to him even when you don't like your circumstances or your situation? Will you trust God in the moments where you can see his redemption and in the moments that it feels like you've been forgotten in a pit for years? Because if we want to see God's redemptive power in our life like Joseph did, we have to walk in continual trust to him. And I've got three places that I think the story of Joseph shows us that we need to walk in that trust and submission and surrender to our father. And so will you trust God with his instruction to forgive. You know, our entire system of belief and faith is built on this idea that we've created an unforgivable offense against a holy and perfect God. There is nothing that we can do to make that right, and yet, through his son Jesus and his sacrifice for us, we have been forgiven. We have ex experienced mercy and grace from this Father that we have continually offended. And so we get the incredible truth that we would not be in the family of God were it not for his forgiveness. We are all incredible recipients of his grace and kindness and forgiveness in our life. And as such, we are commanded then to live that out to others. Ephesians 4.32 puts it this way. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. See, this isn't a suggestion or encouragement to us. 
but rather an instruction and command to be the ones living out forgiveness to the people around us. And when you step back and think about what, what we preach, what we believe, what we say we ascribe to in terms of our theology and understanding, we as followers of Christ should be the biggest proponents and champions of grace and forgiveness in our culture. And yet, so often people look from the outside in and see people that are instead defined by bitterness and anger and resentment and unforgiveness. So how do we fix that? How do we go from people who are known as, as bitter, unforgiving, hate-filled people to instead being people who are known by grace and kindness, who are tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave us? And I got three ideas for us out of Joseph's story. The first is to remember that God is in control. God is in control of our circumstances, but also God is in control of the justice that we desire. When we've been wronged like Joseph, it can be tempting to try and take control of that and try and be the steward of justice to the world and the people around us. But God is in control. You see, Joseph say that, he, he, when talking to the brothers, he says, am I in the place of God? He says, is it my job to bring justice, to bring punishment, to bring retribution? He says, I'm not in the place of God. Similarly, uh, Romans 12, verse 19, tells us today to leave room for the wrath of God. Leave room for God to punish, for God to work, because he is in control. He sees the ways that you've been wronged and hurt. He sees the people that have done that to you, and he will bring about justice. We have to trust that he's going to do that in his time, in his way. But that means that we can let go of the scorecard. We can let go of the notepad that's keeping track of the rights and the wrongs, the blessings and curses, and trust that God is in control of that. Secondly, if we wanna grow in grace, we can do that by remembering the forgiveness that we've received. See, again, I said our, our faith is built upon this idea that we've been incredible recipients of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness, so much so that scripture says it changes our identity. We become children of God. We are called holy, chosen, dearly loved saints. Our identity has changed because of what Jesus has done in our life. And I wonder if the thing that's holding some of us back uh, of living with more forgiveness and grace is some spiritual amnesia, that we've forgotten what we were like before Jesus. We've forgotten the things that he's forgiven us for. We've forgotten the, the depth of our sin and depravity that we've in, experienced incredible mercy and grace for. And so if you're struggling to forgive someone, I wonder if what would be helpful is just to pause and go, God, let me see a moment of just what I was like without you. What regrets, what failures, what sins and mistakes and, and, and things have you done towards others and towards God? And those don't define you anymore because of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross for you. But the perspective there may be powerful because you may reflect back and realize that you had a sin that's adjacent to the thing you're struggling to forgive and God has already forgiven you of that. Or maybe you just need the reminder that if you've done these things against a holy and perfect God, you can forgive someone who sinned against you. Finally, if we wanna grow in grace, maybe it requires us understanding that forgiveness and reconciliation are different. They're separate activities for us as followers of Christ. This is something I've been talking a lot about with people lately, and I think that a lot of Christian teaching lumps forgiveness and reconciliation together, and it says that if someone's offended you, you're to forgive them and pretend like nothing ever happened, you go right back to where you were in your relationship. But there's two separate activities that are there. And see, we are called to forgive literally everybody. Anyone who has harmed us, who has hurt us, who has offended us, we are called to be tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave us. It doesn't matter their, their posture, how they responded, how they've acted since, if they've changed their life, we are to forgive them. But reconciliation, restoring that relationship, going back to where we were, isn't always possible. Sometimes it's not safe or not wise to do so. Sometimes. The other person has done nothing to allow for reconciliation to take place. See, Romans 12, 18 says this. It says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with all. 
That's so as much as it depends on you means we need to be forgiving and doing everything we can to pursue reconciliation, but we can't change the other person. We can't force them to do what's required to restore our relationship, to restore that situation, to reconcile. And maybe the thing that we need to do is understand that we need to forgive even if reconciliation isn't possible. And don't let the, the lack of reconciliation keep us from forgiving because we are called to do that to everyone. Now there's much more I could say, but it's pretty clear God has forgiven us, we're to forgive others, so who do you need to forgive? Who tonight do you need to make the decision to forgive? Like Joseph, is it someone in your family? Is it a parent? Is it, is it a sibling? Is it a step-parent? Is it a, a spouse or an ex? Is it a, a boss or a coworker or some stranger who has harmed you? Who is it that you need to forgive? And let me challenge you to, to follow the example of Joseph here and to take a step today to choose forgiveness to make a phone call before the weekend's over and start that process of forgiveness, to write a letter if a phone call is not possible and to, to, to start that conversation. If that person isn't living or not accessible, still write the letter. Maybe you're not ready to do one of those bigger steps, but maybe the decision you need to make today is to choose to let go of the bitterness, the anger, the resentment, and say, I want to forgive. Maybe that's all you can do right now is just making that aspirational goal. I want to let go of the bitterness and choose forgiveness and let God lead you down the path towards the destination. But who do you need to forgive? Because God has called us to be people who live that out with our life. Will you trust him and live in that forgiveness? Because the amazing thing is that, that when we do that, not only is our life changed, but there's this ripple effect of transformation that can happen. See, Joseph forgave his brothers instead of wiping them out. And in doing so, he preserved God's promise to establish the nation of Israel. That nation was established as recipients of God's promise, and that nation is the one who brought forth the Messiah, the one who came for us to be forgiven, to be set free from our life of sin. And so we today are recipients of Joseph's decision to forgive and show mercy. And so maybe you need to forgive and show mercy and trust God in that instruction. Maybe similarly, you need to simply step back and trust God in his ability to redeem. You look at your life and maybe the thing holding you up from forgiveness is you, you look at the ways that your life has been broken and affected by those situations and hurts. And we need to remember that God has the power to redeem our life, to bring redemption to the things that are broken and shattered to bring beauty from the ashes to restore and, and bring about good from things that are evil. And part of this trust, though, is trusting in God's way and his timing. Because it's easy to go, God, I trust you to redeem my life and here's how you should do it. <laughs> Except we don't see that in Scripture. Joseph's story doesn't even exemplify that because Joseph, he probably had an idea of what redemption would look like. But Joseph doesn't go back home. He doesn't get his coat of many colors back. He doesn't get his position, his favorite son back. He doesn't get the life that he had dreamed of. And yet he still saw God's incredible redemption and power in his life. And so maybe we need to trust God and his ability to redeem by holding intention to wonderful things. And the first is to let go of, of the, the, the temptation to strive or manipulate for that redemption. Some of you go, yes, I believe that God is going to redeem my life, so I'm doing everything I can to make that happen. And you keep striving and, and clawing and, and pushing to make that happen, and maybe you just need to sit back and say, God, I trust you to do this however you want to. And I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop manipulating to make that happen. But maybe some of you are on the other side, and you need to not let go of the hope that God can redeem and hold these two things in tension with each other. Because God will redeem in his timing and maybe you're on the other side and you're hopeless about God bringing about good things in your marriage or your family or your work or that hurt that's in your life. And maybe you, your challenge is just to have hope that God can and will bring about good 
through any situation. So you trust God in his instruction to forgive and his ability to redeem. Finally, will you trust God with his plans for your life? See, God has plans for each of us, plans that are far better than ours. As you look at the life of Joseph, you don't fully understand what he thought his plans were gonna be and what he was striving for, but you know that it's not imprisonment and slavery and abandonment in a foreign country. And yet he trusted God's plans enough to be faithful and honor him at every step to serve diligently, to to live with character and intentionality, to be a follower of Christ in every way, to to really demonstrate what it meant to live faithfully to his God. And because of that, he was able to see God bring about good things. And I think that if we want to to have peace in these difficult situations, to have peace in these tensions of places to forgive and show mercy, It requires us trusting that God's plans won't be thwarted by evil people around us. God's plans for Joseph still happened. The dream that he experienced that started this whole sequence of events came to bear where his brothers bowed down and he was in a place of authority and power. God's plans weren't stopped by the brothers. They weren't stopped by Potiphar's lying wife. They weren't stopped by abandonment in prison. They had some interruptions and changes, but God still brought his plans to bear. And he'll do the same in our life too. He will still bring about good things in our life no matter what our circumstances look like. So today, let me ask you again, will you trust God and be faithful to him? Will you be faithful when you don't like your circumstances? Will you be obedient to his instructions when you don't necessarily like or agree with them? Will you accept his call to follow him even when it's challenging? Because if you do, then I know that you're gonna see him transform and show up in power in your life just like it was with Joseph. And at the end of the day, as we wrap up this look at Joseph, we see the incredible power of grace. Because at the end of the day, Joseph trusted God with his plans, with his life, with his circumstances, and even with that call to show grace. It was grace that allowed Joseph to keep moving forward. It was grace that allowed him to reconcile with his brothers. It was grace that allowed for this nation of Israel to be established. It was grace that allowed for all of this to take place. And today, it's grace that allows us to have a relationship with our creator and to be called dearly loved children of God. So in Joseph's story and in our story, we see that grace wins. And today, I pray that you would choose grace first by following and trusting in Jesus as your savior, and secondly, by living out a life of forgiveness and mercy to those around you. Because when we do, we're gonna see God's power show up and transform our life. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that that you have shown us mercy even when we did not deserve it. And I thank you for a story of a man 3,000 plus years ago that shows us just the incredible power that trusting you and walking with you can have. And it points us to the, the transforming effect of grace that has a ripple effect for generations. And so I pray today that you would help us to walk in that. Help us to be people who are, are ever aware of the grace and mercy that we've received from you and be ready and willing to give that to the people around us. God, help us to be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving one another as you forgave us in Christ. It's not easy and we're always looking for ways to keep score and to hold a grudge and to bring about justice. So help us to trust you and surrender all of that to you because you have done so much for us. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. God truly worked to redeem Joseph's story by reuniting his family after they sold him into slavery. What a great example of extending forgiveness and trusting God for the outcome. We'd love to learn more about you and invite you to connect with us by filling out an online connect card by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash connect. One of our pastors will contact you and get to know you and pray with you. 
Well, that's all for this week. I hope you have a terrific week ahead and please come back and join us again next weekend. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.